We gather together this morning to serve you and to thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you for counting us worthy to serve you and know you as the only true God. Accept our thanks and praises in Jesus' name. Today is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad. Father, we pray for comfort for those who are suffering, whether physically or mentally. We ask that they sense your presence with them. Be with those who are experiencing loss. May they seek you for support. As we continue with this service, fill us with your unlimited joy and refresh our spirits. We ask that you are with Pastor John this morning as he brings us the message and that we hear it and put it into action. Let everyone see your glory and power through us. Amen. Well, good morning, and thankful to be here this morning. Just, uh, I think back to last year, I was actually here uh, this Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, uh, as Pastor Mike was on vacation, had the opportunity to, to preach, and so it's just very much God's hand on this. A year later, I'm here, and I'm preaching again, and you're going to keep hearing me over and over and over again now, but uh, so glad that I can be here this first Sunday of Advent, and we'll just pretend that candle's lit down in front. So let's we'll pretend. They tried. We tried. So um, so anyways, I want you right now just to think about or picture in your mind your, your favorite story uh, of all time. Just think about what would be your, your favorite story of all time. Of course, it could be a, a movie. It could be a novel. It could be even a kid's story. Uh, right now, my son is 10 months old, and basically all, everything I read right now is just kid stories over and over and over again, and uh, some of them are good, some of them a little mind-numbing, but anyways, um, I have most of them memorized, which is good, but anyways, uh, think about what, what would be your favorite story of all time. For me, again, processing this this week about what may I again, I can go different directions depending on my mood, but... I picked uh, The Lord of the Rings would be my, my favorite story of all time. Of course, I, I am taking a Lord of the Rings class when I was in college. Uh, yeah, there they was definitely a class. Uh, I read the book back then. Also, when the movies came out, it was during my late high school, college years. Just, you know, fell in love with those movies. I mentioned, of course, last week, I love movies. I love uh, even doing movie marathons. We watch a bunch of movies in a day. I've done that, watching all three of those movies all in one day. It's like 12, 13, 14 hours, depending on if you watch like the extended edition of those movies. Um, I can't do that anymore. I can't sit there straight and watch 12 straight hours of movies. But anyways, uh, this great story, just great quest. There's just a, this amazing aspect. Of it. And even now when I watch those movies, it just reminds me back to those days of, you know, being younger and just yeah, just a great reminder of a good story. And so, again, for you, there like, may be different options that you may pick for your, your favorite story. But I want you to go back, maybe the first time uh, you ever heard or you've ever watched that movie or read that book, and think if you decide, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to check out this story. I think I'm just going to go open the book halfway. It's the middle, right in the middle and get started. Or I'm going to turn this movie on, and I'm just going to turn it on halfway through the movie do you think now, after only just watching half of it, would you really be enjoying it? Would you think it's your, your favorite story of all time? Probably not. And you probably would go in halfway, be very confused about what's really going on uh, in the story. You'd be confused. You just wouldn't be able to pull it off. I know if I would do that with Lord of the Rings, I'd be like, what does this ring have to do with anything? Or what are these battles fighting? Why are there so many weird different creatures in this thing? Uh, but anyways, they're just everything would be very confusing. And it just doesn't work to start in the middle of a story. You can't crack open a novel and begin reading in the middle and make any sense of what's happening. Uh, there'll be conversations that make no sense to you. There'll be things that people are choosing to do that confuse you completely. You can't walk into the middle of a movie and make sense out of what's happening. I've done one with TV shows. I know at uh, times where I've worked in evenings, I've come home and my wife is walk it, watching a television show that only she would watch. And I sit down and just uh, tune in towards what's going on. And I have no idea. I try my best. I have no idea what's going on makes it hard to really understand what's going on. Uh, you can't also jump into the middle of a conversation and actually say things that are appropriate without knowing where that conversation has already been. 
you just can't begin in the middle of a story. And if you start in the Christmas season, you start in this Advent se- season with the, just the baby in Bethlehem already, you're not starting at the beginning of the story. You're actually starting at the middle of the story. And there'll be things that just won't make sense. You know, why are there this, the celebratory songs of the angels? Why this fearful anticipation of the shepherds? Why this inquisitive journey of the wise men? Why is there this panic of Herod from Herod? Why, why, why? You really have to begin in the roots of the story, and that's why, what I want to do over these next few Sundays. I, of course, I want to say this one thing for you this morning to have you consider it, and that's the idea that the story of the baby in the manger is actually rooted in the grief in the heart of God. You know, I want to say that again. The story of that baby in the manger is actually rooted in the grief of the heart of God. If you don't understand that grief in the heart of God, you won't understand the glory, the amazing, the awesomeness of the story of Jesus, that baby in the manger. Again, turn with me, if you would, uh, to Genesis 6. I'm going to read through verses 5 through 8. And, of course, it's also going to be on the screen uh, right there for us. Uh, But I'm going to read through this passage, maybe not really a normal Advent passage, but I think it's beneficial for us to get started with this four-week series. Uh, Let me start. I'm going to read starting with verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I'll wipe uh, from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Again, like I mentioned, not really a normal passage to use during this Advent season, but I think it's going to be helpful for us as we kick off this story, this Advent story off right. And uh, I think before we go into walking through this passage, it would be helpful for us just to ask God to really, you know, dig deep. Help us open up our ears, open up our hearts towards what you have in store for us, not only this morning, but also during this, this time of Advent. So will you join me in prayer right now? A Holy Father, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear, that we may, may read, may inwardly digest them, that through the comfort of your Holy Word we may embrace and every whole, ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's look at verse 6, which is the nice red one highlighted right there. It says, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply, deeply troubled. Again, consider just for a moment this, the, the deeply personal nature of these words. And the Lord, God himself, was deeply troubled, that he regretted. What is it that, that would bring such grief to the heart of God? And these words, uh, they connote something that's personal, some kind of personal offense, some kind of personal affront, some kind of personal betrayal. So so what offense, what betrayal, what personal thing could be that significant that would bring literal tears to the heart of God? You know, what what is it? Well, we're going to look at verse 5 here. And it says this. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of of the human race had, had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Could you get a more graphic, a more specific, more all-inclusive words here than here? God saw that the wickedness from man was great. Now all over the inhabited earth were people that were and constantly they were doing things that were evil in the sight of God. That every intention of the thought of the heart of people were actually evil continually. And what powerfully graphic words in this passage. Could there even be maybe a sadder passage in all of Scripture than this one? But I really want you to think about this. You don't really understand the great tragedy, the great horror of these words. You don't understand their tragedy. You don't understand the sad thing that would bring such grief to the heart of God if you don't first understand these words on a relational level. Now, these words were not just something applied several thousand years ago, but something that applies to us even today. 
This passage is describing something that's deeply personal, and if you don't understand the deeply personal, the deeply relational aspect of what's being described here, we don't really understand this whole Jesus baby being born in the manger. So we're gonna, let's dig into that this morning. First, we need to know that human beings were created and hardwired to love God. That love of God, that God word fa- uh, way of love, that God consciousness that was to be the thing that would shape every thought and every motive, every choice, every decision, every word, every action. So fundamentally that you could ask me if I was living this out in every situation, why I'm doing what I'm doing, and I could give the answer, God. It's because of God. I would recognize his existence, I would recognize his authority, I would recognize his grandeur, and as a deeply, an act of deeply personal love, I would choose to serve him with all my time and my energy. You know, that's what we were created to do. We were made for God. Again, we were made to, to love God. And of course, I'm not describing something that's just a spiritual thing for spiritual people. This is what all human beings were made to do. This is the calling of all humanity, is to love God. You see, all of us were built, were created to love. But of course, if you, were, if you were wired to love, everything you would do in your life, wherever you do it, is always driven and motivated by love. And that love that was to motivate us was that God-focused love. And that's how we were meant to live. And you see, it's so important to understand that obedience is not somehow some kind of technical submission to abstract rules. That's not what obedience is. Obedience actually is rooted in the love of God. And because I love God, the lawgiver, I find joy in staying staying inside his boundaries. I find joy in what he calls me to do. I find joy in serving him. I find joy in pointing to his glory because I love him. You know that's true in any relationship, right? When you love someone, you want to serve them. You desire to please them. You find joy in their joy. That's how every human being who has ever given life and breath was meant to live. That was the plan. And now it's very clear for us when we see in Genesis 6-5 that something has happened because there must be some other love that has claimed the heart of human beings. Because they no longer delight to serve God. They no longer find their joy in his joy. No longer do they want to stay inside of his boundaries. But they willingly, purposely, continually do what is evil in his eyes. So what would bring distress to his heart? How could it be any worse than what we see here in this passage? For a moment, I just want you to think of Christ's summary of the law. When Jesus is, Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He summarized the law and it begins with this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself. So, of course, what's the, the greatest commandment? What's the command of all commands? The root command is, of course, to love God. And, of course, that is a love that initiates all the other commands. So if love for God is the ultimate command, then the greatest evil of evils is a failure to love God because when we don't love God, I will not stay inside my boundaries and I will not live for his glory. Now, of course, we need to understand this, that when human beings no longer love God as they should, it doesn't mean that they don't love because you always love. Again, we were hardwired to be people who love. So if you're not loving God, then you will give that love to somebody else. And no one in this room, no one watching online is loveless. And of course, that's why it's important for us all to say you're all people who love. And God owns your love at the deepest, most profound level or something else does. And so when you're reading in this passage about all this evil and wickedness that brought grief to the heart of God, you should ask the question, so what love is so seductive and so powerful and so deceptive that has the possibility in sin to replace the love that I was meant to have for God. You know, what's, you know, that's an important question for us to ask. And you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, as he's making just a brief comment on the importance of Jesus coming to earth uh, for us in 2 Corinthians 5.15, he says this. He says, and he died for all, that uh, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You see, the thing that always replaces love for God, the thing that leads to this endless catalog of evil that we see in the world is the love for self. 
somehow or some way, we all insert ourselves into the center of our world, don't we? Somehow or some way, all of us ascend to God's throne in our lives. And we don't delight in serving him. We're obsessed with our own will and our way. We want to be sovereign over our own lives. We want to set our own rules. We're obsessed with our own comfort and our own pleasure and our own happiness. And when you live for yourself, we will step over God's boundaries again and again and again because your heart is not motivated by the love of him. Of course, it doesn't take a whole lot. We can just look around us and we see so much evidence of this dominating, controlling, enslaving, life-shaping love, self-love. So what, what is it that makes, you know, a marriage so hard? It's, of course, selfishness. It's self-love. I marry you because I have a wonderful plan for your life. Again, what, what, what makes it so hard for us to serve other people? So hard to let a discussion go about becoming an argument. So hard not to say, I told you so. And so easy to feed myself, and I'm not really concerned about feeding other people. So wanting to have so much of a struggle with giving, is, is it not that the, this time, this love of self that so quickly replaces love for God? What is it that makes parenting so hard? Well, <laughs> you're giving birth to a bunch of self-sovereign people. They want to write their own law. They want to set their own rules. No kid has ever said, you know, Dad, Mom, if you could just give me some more rules, if you could exercise more authority in my life, I would feel so much more secure, so much happier. If your kids ever said that, then keep those kids. That's for sure. Or grandkids ever said that. You got to keep them. My, my son I, Isaac is only 10 months old, and he has every toy in the world that he could ever, ever want. But you know what he wants to play with? The things he's not allowed to. The things that we tell him not to. The things like our cell phones, or our computers, or our remotes, or drink glasses. He absolutely lunges for those items and everything we tell him that he is not allowed to play with for his own safety or for those things safety, the item safety, you know, he wants. He wants to play, he wants to make the rules. He wants to be in charge. Now, of course, this is a, a funny story, but think about this. Every act of murder and violence is rooted in self-love. Every moment of greed is rooted in self-love. Every gossip is rooted in self-love. Every bit of disobedience to parents is rooted in self-love. Every moment of adultery is rooted in self-love. You see, the evil of the world has happened because we no longer love God as we should. You know, it's a tragedy. It's a, it's a horror because the world was designed to have that center the love of God. And when it's not there, things that should work don't work. Things explode into evil and chaos. And we experience that every single day with just by turning online, going online or watching the news. It's a tragedy. It's, it's sad the way the world is. Listen, you know, God loves the creatures that he made by the fact that his heart is broken. Because if you love someone and they turn their back on you, they betray that love and they set their love on someone else, if your heart isn't broken, then you don't have love within you. And God proves in this passage that himself is not just that, he, not that just he's sovereign or not just to be a, he's a creator, not just that he's almighty, but he's a God of marvelous love as he weeps at the betrayal because human life was meant to be a beautiful love relationship between God and man. So how sad is it when we read this passage that you should let your mind's eye, you know, your, your mental you know, focus to go see the tears in the eyes of God. That you also should let your imagination of your ears go to hear weeping, crying from the voice of God. You know, God is grieved because not only has that love been taken from him, that love has been stolen from us. It is the ultimate of human betrayals. So if you get to that point in the passage, you have to be asking this question. So what in the world is God going to do? How will God respond to this ultimate betrayal? Because you see, God understands this, that you know, every sin that happens is a sin that's vertical. Again, it's a sin that is going up towards God. Because you have never ever sinned a purely horizontal, purely man-to-man -man sin in your life. Every sin is forgetting him. Every sin is refusing to love him. Every sin is a rejection of his presence and his glory and his authority. Every sin 
is vertical. That's why David, in confessing his sin of murder and adultery, in Psalm 51.4 is saying this. Move to the next slide there for me. It says, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge. So what David is saying, listen, my failure wasn't first that I didn't love Bathsheba and Uriah as I should. God, my failure was that I didn't love you as I should. And when I didn't love you as I should, I was able to do these horrendous, terrible things. And this is against you, God. Again, if you were God, how would you respond in this act of betrayal? We'll look here at verses 7 and 8. I didn't move up, sorry. I guess it is working right now. It says uh, here in verse 7, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Of course, verse 7 sounds like a sad and horrible ending to the story, right? Don't you hate it when you watch one of those movies and you're hoping for a great ending and it ends in disaster? You say, of course, I spent 90 minutes of my life for that course you just read just that one verse it sounds like that though that God not in an act of ugly ugly vengeance but God in holy righteous justice says says this enough I made you I owned you I provided every good thing you could ever want a life of beauty that you could never ever made for yourself and this is what you do you turn your back on me I will wipe you off the face of the earth I will wipe the earth clean You know, God, of course, has every right to to do this. And it's not an unrighteous anger. It is holy and righteous justice that sends the waters of the flood to wipe the earth clean. And, of course, this would seem like it's the end of the story. You would say, no, no, this this story has to end something another way. This love story has to end differently. Well, thankfully, it's not the end of the story because Genesis 6 has a verse 8. And it says this, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. By an act of sovereign grace, God placed his favor on Noah and his family. Of course, you know this story. They were chosen by God's grace to survive the waters of the flood with some animals there in the ark. And it's very important to note that when, what happens after the waters of the flood receded and the earth dries. God makes a covenant with Noah, and God basically says something like this. He says, Noah, I'm going to bless you, and not only bless you, but I'm going to bless your descendants. And if you read through that genealogy that follows that statement, you'll read a lot of names you'll probably never read much before, but you'll come to a very, very familiar name, and that is the name of Abraham. Because Abraham was one of those, those descendants, and God made a covenant with Abraham, and he said to Abraham basically this, not only will your descendants be blessed, but through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we know from the Apostle Paul it alerts us to the fact that the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And you see that the only way this horrible brokenness of a relationship could be fixed, could be rectified, is for God to send his son. And again, I want to say that again. The only way that this horrible brokenness of a relationship could be fixed, could be rectified, is for God to send his son. Hmm. Chris, let's, let's look, look at Genesis 6 here again. I just want to walk through why it says this, the red that's highlighted right there. It says, The Lord saw how great wickedness, great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Like in our, our big problem is not, first, a behavior problem, but all, if all of our problem was something that we would just do wrong occasionally, that would be just a behavior thing, we behave in a wrong way, that you could probably fix, you could probably reform yourself and do better. But your problem is deeper than that in this this verse, in this passage. Basically, it's saying that the idea that our problem is a a heart problem. Move on, next slide for me. Your problem is a heart problem. In the Bible, the heart is the control center of the human being. The heart is a directional system of the human being. The heart is your causal core and whatever controls my heart will then control my words and behavior. The only thing I'm not able to do in my life is escape the way my heart is. And so, you know, I need to be rescued. 
Move on to the next slide for me. I need to be rescued. Someone needs to do for me what I can't do for myself. Am I ever going to be one of those people that loves God in the way that he was meant to be loved? I need rescue. And so God sends his son, the Lord Jesus, to be exposed to all the harsh realities of life in a fallen world and to live in the midst of all that brokenness and all that temptation in an utterly perfect life, that life that flowed out of his love for God, his love for the Father. And of course he says, I came to do your will, my Father. And in every thought and every desire and every word and every action, he perfectly obeyed. He did what we were unable to do, and he died a satisfactory death. He took our sin upon himself and paid the penalty for our sin when his death, with his death so that there could be hope for us, that finally that love of self would be defeated and be replaced by the love of God, so that someday we would stand before him and every cell of our hearts would fully love him so that every word, every thought, every action will be pleasing in his sight. And that is the hope of redemption. Now we know that the, the work, though, of the Messiah, the work of Jesus is an event, and it's also a process. By his work on the cross, the power of sin has been broken. He's made a public spectacle of the enemy, triumphing over him by the cross. And so I need to not live under the slavery of sin any longer, but you know this, the presence of sin still remains and is being, of course, removed in my life through, through grace, but still there. Of course, there, there are times when your thoughts and my thoughts are shaped by the love of God, but not always. There are times when the things we desire flow out of our love for God, but that's not always. There are times when the words you speak are formed, the content of those words are formed by the love of God, but not always. There are times when you act in ways that you wouldn't act if you didn't first love God, but of course, not always. I'm sure you, we all have gave evidence this week that the war of love still goes on in our hearts. And that brought evil and chaos in the places that we live. Maybe even that struggle was even this morning. Even as we're preparing to go to a service, this opportunity for worship, there's just outbreaks of self-love create anger and division and conflict. It's ironic that we are people like that. And so everyone in this room and those watching online still need to embrace this sad reality of this betrayal and the glorious celebration and the hope that is ours represented by that baby in a manger who has come on this mission of rescue and deliverance. And because he came, there will be a day where there will be a company of people whose every cell within their hearts, will be controlled by the love of God and they will live inside of God's boundaries and live for his glory forever and ever and ever. Of course, maybe this is a story that you're very familiar with. Maybe you've placed your trust in Jesus already, but you would say this morning, you know, you're right, I still see this war inside my heart. I need the resources of your grace, God, that only can be found in Jesus. Or maybe you're here this morning, and for the first time, you have this, this insight, this perspective, this thought of, you know, I don't think I've ever lived for anyone but me before. You know, I would encourage you this morning to confess that to the Savior Jesus. You can seek his forgiveness, to seek his grace. We see the moment of judgment of the flood wasn't the end of the story, because this God of glory and power and sovereignty is a God of glorious grace. And of course, he sent his son. We move on to the last slide for me. He sent the son of his love to, by grace, return to us our capacity to love him in the way that we were designed to truly love. And so as we close our time this morning before I enter into the time of prayer, I just want to give you all the opportunity to just ask God for forgiveness. If you're in that camp of like, you know, I've made a, a decision to follow after you, Jesus, but I know that there's still a war within my heart, that still I go back to that, that love of self time and time again, this will be time just to confess that to God. Or maybe, again, this is for you, the first time you realize, you know, I don't think I've ever given you my love, God. Maybe that's an opportunity for you to, to confess that and ask for God's forgiveness here this morning. So we're going to take some time and just in silence. And then I'll close out our time of prayer before we go into worship.
Lord, may our hearts be stirred with this, this tragedy, this horror of this passage of Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8. And so that they may be gripped by the celebration of the coming of Jesus to earth who would live and die in our place so that we would have hope of a complete restoration of that love for you as it was meant to be the single most powerful force of motivation in our hearts. We would say that we love, but we must say that we are so thankful that we've been loved by you. Thank you for your redeeming, forgiving, and delivering love. In Jesus' name, amen.